So, foot soldier, you probably didn't mean it, but you just help prop up white supremacy. This is a world. This is a world premiere. This is a world. Hey, y'all, welcome back to the vlog. So, today I'm going to talk about a recent video that was made by Foot Soldier addressing the idea of systemic racism in the United States and whether or not it exists. Now, in this video, Foot Soldier presents what seems to be a fairly balanced perspective of racism in the United States. Now, he claims right out in the video that he is not an expert or an authority on racism and that he probably shouldn't be talking about racism at all. Now, in the long run, he concedes that likely there are problems with systemic racism in the United States, but then he undercuts all of it by what he does next. Foot Shoulder shares a clip from an interview on the Dave Rubin Report with Larry Elder. Now, those who know Larry Elder, he is an African-American who is fairly middle class, upper middle class, who tends to present very conservative views of the state of African-Americans in the US. And by conservative views, I mean that Larry Elder tends to present opinions and perspectives that support the dominant narrative about African-Americans as somehow broken or flawed and that the issues that they deal with in America have nothing to do with structural racism. In the clip that Foot Soldier shares, he shows Larry Elder making a claim that there seems to be some conspiracy to paint a portrait of African Americans as victims. Now, anybody who's paying attention doesn't need Larry Elder to point out to them or anyone else pointing out to them that African Americans have gotten the wrong raw end of a deal in the US. You can go back to slavery if you want to, but you can look at more recent history up until the late 60s until America passed something known as the Civil Rights Act. Blacks could be treated basically any way that a white person wanted to treat them, and white people tended to treat black people horrendously. I was born into a world before the Civil Rights Act was passed, and so anyone who was raised by someone like me, or even slightly younger, might have been raised by someone who had a very concrete material experience with racism and who may be harboring some discomfort or insecurity or mistrust of white people because of that experience. Now, of course, the fact that there are people who believe that there is still racism because they experienced that racism firsthand when they were younger and they don't see how the changes have been made to shift the way Americans think, particularly white Americans think, to the point where there is no racism. That just doesn't seem plausible to a lot of people, and that might be acceptable or not, depending on who you are. What Larry Elder attempts to do in the interview is shift the focus from structural racism to somehow a breakdown of the family in African American communities. Now, Mr. Elder points to some statistics that claim that children who grow up in single parent households stand a greater chance of getting a bad education, ending up in poverty, ending up incarcerated. Mr. Elder makes it clear he's talking about absent fathers. He points to Barack Obama's 2008 Father's Day speech to support his claim. In fact, one of these statistics is that a child from a single parent household is nine times more likely to end up in poverty. Now, this is nine times more likely than the average child in America. What Mr. Elder fails to talk about is that even in households, African American households, poor African American households where fathers are present, the likelihood of those fathers being unemployed is higher. The likelihood is higher of those fathers having been convicted of a crime, which means that it's even more difficult for them to get a job. Mr. Elder doesn't talk about research and studies that have come out of places like the University of California, University of Michigan, and Michigan State University, where they found that African Americans were seven times more likely to be found or convicted of a crime that they were innocent of in the first place. He doesn't mention the fact that if you've been convicted of a crime, it means that you cannot live in public health housing, which means that fathers who may even want to stay with their families in public housing can't. Perhaps this is having an effect on the family. He doesn't point to the fact that even blacks that end up breaking out of poverty may still find themselves living in communities where they are surrounded by other families who are impoverished.
poverty. So this means that even the families of blacks who are doing well may find themselves exposed to things like poverty and violence as they grow up. These families end up in these communities because they're directed there by real estate agents, because landlords won't give them apartments in more affluent neighborhoods, even if their credit is spotless and even if they have a job that will afford them to pay the rent. Dave Rubin asked Larry Elder to address the fact that there are great disparities between blacks and whites in America. Now Larry Elder puts it back on Dave Rubin to tell him one case where there is a disparity between blacks and whites that is systemic in the United States. Dave in response to Larry Elder talks about the occurrences of police violence in black communities. Now Larry Elder tries to write this off by saying that the occurrences of police shootings of whites is higher than the occurrence of police shootings of blacks. But when you look at the data, you'll see that white people make up 62% of the population, but only 49% of the individuals who are shot and killed by the police. Black people who make up 13% of the population make up 24% of the individuals who are shot and killed by the police. There's a little bit of a disparity there. Now, Larry Elder says that it's black communities that are exaggerating things. If it's 2.5 times more likely to be shot by a police officer if you're African American, that means that it's 2.5 times more likely in communities of color that they know someone who's been shot by the police, be it a family member or a friend or a neighbor. Now think about the effects on the culture in a community where pretty much everyone knows someone or knows someone who knows someone who's lost someone to police violence. And then Larry Elder goes on to talk about black on black crime, somehow insinuating that that is not a concern of individuals who live in black communities, as if black people aren't concerned with their own safety, that black people wouldn't see the day-to-day -day violence that happens in their communities as a major issue. He claims that a lack of social justice isn't a factor in any of this. He says that's because every time there's a police shooting in a black community that the media shows up and it turns into another march on Washington. Now, I'm not sure if that means that the media is exaggerating or that the march on Washington itself wasn't a very big deal. One could very well say that it's the media that's perpetuating this image of black communities as violent and that black people are criminals, because ultimately those are the images that the public sees every day. He then stammers as he claims that justice is served for the most part in these police shootings, which leads me to question how often does justice go unserved before it becomes a problem? He talks about the reality that police shootings in black communities are on the decline, which might be seen as evidence that groups like Black Lives Matter are actually having a positive effect. He then lists a few high profile cases of blacks being killed by the police. He mentions Eric Gardner who was killed while resisting arrest. I suppose he considers struggling to escape a chokehold that is killing you resisting arrest. He mentions Tamir Rice twirling a gun. Tamir Rice was 12 years old and never even received a warning from the police before he was shot twice and killed. Now Larry Elder goes on to say that what black leadership really needs to do is explain to black people how they should behave when they are confronted with police officers. Now does this mean that white leadership should talk to white people about how to behave when they're confronted by the police? Why is that only an issue in black communities? Later, Larry Elder claims that being poor makes one more eligible for things like grants and loans, giving them access to higher education. Of course, what good is more access to higher education if your entire history of education leading up to that point hasn't prepared you for a college academic career. You can give me a rocket ship, but if I don't know how to use a rocket ship, it's not gonna get me to the moon. Now Larry Elder claims that he's seen as a threat for having these opinions. Even though what he says is not complete, they aren't necessarily untrue, and they just lead to deeper conversations about the reasons for the breakdown of the family, the reasons for poverty in black communities. These opinions only become problematic if they're only being used to prop up a dominant, narrative about what the experience of black people are in the United States. Encouraging black families to be strong is a good thing. Encouraging black fathers to take care of their kids is a good thing. It's only when you assume that somehow black families are weak or that black fathers don't want to take care of their children that it becomes an issue. I don't understand why Foot Soldier thinks that Larry Elder is in a better position to talk about the state of racism in the United States. Larry Elder is a middle class, upper middle class academic who leads a fairly comfortable life. He doesn't know what poor 
young blacks are dealing with. He doesn't know the experience of fathers who are facing incarceration at the rates that they are in the US. He doesn't know about the struggles of single African-American mothers in the US. He's just looking up numbers and making his opinions based on those numbers. And if the picture that he paints isn't very complete, then to me, it's not as useful. Anyone can go and look up the statistics and then ask the questions that would be needed to discover why these statistics are what they are. And you're gonna discover that blacks are doing poorly in the US. And you're either gonna decide that it's because of a problem with the system or that black people are somehow broken. And if black people are broken, how did they break? So Foot Soldier, I hope that you'll make some more videos where you present some other perspectives on the state of racism and systemic racism in the United States, where we can hear from many voices. Now Foot Soldier probably selected Larry Elder because he's someone who has been given a large platform and you have to question why this particular voice has been given such a large platform. This might have been a subject better suited for say your podcast and maybe a conversation with someone who's interested in this topic and has done research on this topic like say me. Not to toot my own horn but so I'm sure foot soldier that you did your best but your best didn't really make a case for what you yourself say you believe about the existence of systemic racism in the United States. What it does is prop up the dominant narrative about black people being seen as victims victims and black people not being able to take out a business. Hopefully people will watch this video and it will clear some things up. Unfortunately, most of the people who see your video will take that at face value and leave it at that, which is how even a nice guy like Foot Soldier can end up propping up white supremacy. That's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourself. Peace. And I love myself. The world is a ghetto. It does. It